experts at S2 Cognition. S2 Cognition delivers a revolutionary approach to helping athletes understand how in-game decisions impact their performance from the youth levels all the way to the pros. And I am joined by Chris Burke, our good friend Chris Burke, otherwise known on this podcast as Chris from Louisville, our favorite, <laughs> our favorite caller. Uh, and, and I have a lot of nicknames, I think, but Chris <laughs> from Louisville is one Chris, of them. Yeah, Chris, or as Dan McDonald would say, Chris from Louisville. Oh, uh, yeah, but Berkey, so so we're going to be joined in a second by Tr- Troy Tulowitzki, you know, household name, big mm-hmm. leaguer, you know, uh, was was the volunteer coach at Texas recently, played at Long Beach State. And, and really the topic today, um, we're going to talk to Tulo, and then you and I are going to cover this a little bit at the end, is, you know, if I'm a dad out there, if I'm a young coach, how do I navigate the, the hitting philosophies have gotten so extreme and they've gotten like there's just a million of them. And so how do I how do I navigate all this? Um, so we're going to get Tulo's take on it. But give us a teaser. What what's your what's your quick take on this topic? Well, my quick take is, you know, more than you think. Like if you're somebody that thinks the, the world of hitting has has left you by, you know, more than you think. Uh, hitting fair line drives is always has been and always will be a good <laughs> result. Right. Fair line drives. Foul ones don't count. We need fair line drives to the outfield. Uh, I, I, I don't think that will ever change. The, what's changed is the process that we use to evaluate that and to um, what's the approach that's going to produce that the most often. That's where I think the messiness lies currently. Yeah. Yeah. That we have, we have so much information now. I think that's a big part of it. So let, let's get to Tulo. Tulo's got a great story. You know, like yeah. we're, we're going to get into this where um, I, I, I thought Tulo was the perfect guest because Long Beach State, you know, Blair Field, tough place to hit. And then, you know, he goes to Colorado, one of the best places to hit. So let, let's bring Tulo in and then you and I will chat afterwards. Sounds good. All right, Berkey, here we go. Let's welcome in our special guest, Troy Tulowitzki. Tulo, good to have you. Good to see you. Uh, happy whatever day of the week it is. How you doing? I'm doing great. <laughs> Thanks for having me. And, uh, you know, before we start, I want to say thank you to both of you guys. Uh, the way you guys cover college baseball, and I'm a huge advocate, fan, uh, all of the above. Uh, you guys do a great job. Um, and I love listening to you guys all the time. And then when I get a chance to see you guys, which is usually mm-hmm. means uh, the team was playing well, then that's yeah. always a good thing as well. Yeah, too low. Well, thank uh, we, you, buddy. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, Tulo, when someone like you, who is a household name in the big leagues, comes and decides to coach college baseball for free, uh, first of all, <laughs> I hate that you had to do it for free, but I love the credibility that you brought to the college game. Mm. And obviously, you guys mm. had great teams at Texas. That was, uh, you know, r- really, it, it, it's an, it's an, we'll get to the Texas part of this, but it's amazing to think the last four years for Texas, oh. it's been three Omahas. And then a dead last in the Big 12. Like, don't even make the Big 12 tournament. So it's like, you know, and, and obviously you were, you came onto the staff right after that dead last finish. So we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. But we're, we're, and, and let me frame it up this way, Tulo. I think you're the perfect person for Berkey and I to talk about in this regard. You have hit in some crazy environments. So Long Beach State is long been known as like how many college coaches have talked to a recruit and said, if you go to Long Beach State, you'll never play baseball again. You will you might end up on the track team like there's you're going to hit 200 with negative five home runs if you go to Long Beach State. I don't think I said that, but but it's maybe you, know, you might maybe, have. Might yeah. have, I might have whispered it. And then, you know, and then you, you, you're with the Rockies and then Texas, you know, you guys transition at Texas where, you know, under Augie Garrido. There's dominance there, but it's sack bunt and pitch and defend. And, you know, then you guys took Texas and kind of flipped it. You know, like Ivan Melendez is dropping bombs left and right. So let, let's jump in here, Tulo. Let, let's talk about – we Berkey and I want to kind of talk to you about your journey as a hitter and your journey in working with hitters. So let's talk about the amateur side. Tell us about, you know, who you were as a high school hitter, maybe even who you were as a, a little guy, and then – you know, kind of who you became at Long Beach State? Yeah, for one, I didn't have anybody saying anything bad about Blair Field and Long Beach State because no one else wanted me. <laughs> That's right. So, we didn't know who you, you know, were yet. Yeah, no, no one. I wasn't on anybody's radar. I kind of uh, had a few offers, um, and Long Beach was by far my best offer and opportunity, the whole deal. So I didn't have to worry about that. But I will say 
with going there. It fit my personality. It fit me as a baseball player to a T, you know, the dirtbag mentality of playing the game the right way, playing hard, uh, practicing the right way. All those things were, you know, what I was about even as an amateur player. And then you get there, and I think what Blair Field did for me is you have to be a good hitter because you're not going to just drop and drive and hit balls out of that ballpark. You have to learn how to, you know, use right center as a right-hand hitter, let the ball travel, and then you're not trying to do too much. Uh, that was tough for me at the beginning. I was always trying to get my swing off, but at the end of the day, at that college game, uh, it was a perfect place for me because I learned how to be a better hitter there. What about, what about like before even getting to college? I mean, again, this is all hitting centric. We're trying to work through some of the yeah. messiness right now of all the different voices that are in the world of hitting instruction. Well, I mean, it, it could be extensive. It could be very little. Like what was your say eight to 18 life like as a hitter? I mean, was your dad kind of helping you? Did you have a were you so my dad, ball? like what, what was your hitting experience? Yeah, like so my dad was always my coach uh, okay. all the way to high school, um, but no lessons. Um, no, no one was teaching me how to hit. I was trying to learn on my own. My dad would have little cues here and there, try to help me out, but there was no. Like, what was the cue with your dad? Like, was it like just hit line drives? Was he a guy that was telling you to use the back side of the field? Like. What was Papa uh, it, it was season? more intensity stuff, more mentality than it was any okay. swing mechanics. Okay. It was get your swing off, walk up there like you're, you know, someone, um, yeah. all those things. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's still what I, you know, preach to the players that I coach today. Or sure. that was always uh, part of my part of my recipe was, you know, a lot of people didn't like me when I played because I walked up to the plate like. I thought I was Barry Bonds, even though I wasn't. And um, there's a lot to be said about that. So all those things at my younger age really helped me. And then... Um, Did you have a feel for hitting? Like, were you always a pretty good hitter? I mean, could you put the barrel on the ball at pretty much every age? Yeah, I put the barrel on the ball, but I had no clue what I was doing. Sure. Um, I was just going up there trying to compete. And I would, hold, I would say that that was the case. I, I really had to learn to hit uh, in the big leagues, to be honest. Uh, before that, it was honestly trying to figure myself out, competing, um, taking some steps forward, then going going backwards a little bit. Mm -hmm. So it was all so kinds of to, different stances. Yeah, so you get to the big leagues and you're playing with two of the greatest hitters in the world, right? You're playing with Helton and Holiday in one of the best environments in the world to hit. And there were some other dudes on that team. It wasn't like they were the only two bats. But, I mean, you had, you know, probably at the time, maybe the best – one of the best right-handed hitters in the world and Matt Holiday, and then Todd, who was just kind of had already kind of become a legend. Um, like what, what did you, what did you learn in your early years as a big leaguer, both technique and approach? I think I learned more from those guys. Uh, I was real close to Maddie. So it was always conversations on the bus, on the plane, before games, uh, watching video after games, we were real, um, talk about hitting, he would say, hey, you look better when you do this. And I would, uh, even as a young player, say, hey, this is what I noticed in your late kick a little bit. So the communication and just the conversations really helped me out. And I encourage young players to do that. Ask questions, uh, get around good hitters, and just watch them work. And that was more of the Todd Helton relationship. I saw how much he can grind out and at bat. I saw how hard he worked uh, after games mm. uh, hitting. I saw just the grit that he had of being in pain sometimes and battling through those things, the toughness part. Um, so you learn uh, different things from different guys, but those two guys had a huge impact on me as a young player. What was Helton doing after games too, though? That's interesting. It's, it kind of reminds me of golfers. They say that amateur golfers hit a bucket of balls before the round, the pro guys show up, blow, you know, yeah. show and go. And then the pro guys hit their bucket after the round. So I'll tell you this. So, so Matty was the first guy that I really saw work after the game. More of his work was done after the game than it was before the game. Um, and Helton would jump in there every once in a while, and then I'm going to do what, what those guys do. So I'm going to tag along right after the game. So Matty, and I know you guys uh, probably had some conversations with him. Mm -hmm. So I, I wanted every part of what Matt Holiday had. You know, one of the best players in the game at the time. Uh, MVP conversations, the whole deal. And on top of that, even a better guy, as mm -hmm. you guys know. Mm -hmm. So uh, I asked him same thing, like, what are we doing other than getting our, our swing better? And the, the best piece of advice he gave me was that, you know, you don't want to go home after that 0 for 4 and sit on it. 
You want mm. to leave the ballpark saying, you know what? That was a good cage session. My swing's feeling pretty good right now. I have a chance tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So that was basically what we were doing is ending it on a good note because there's so many times we leave that field um, where we're 0 for 4. Our swing doesn't feel good. Or, man, we just gave away four ABs to where, hey, I, I swung it well in the cage tomorrow is going to be my day where I'm going to get a couple hits. So that mm -hmm. was really what the work after the game um, was all about. Love that. The, ahead, the, the, what about the influences later on post Colorado? Like who are some other guys that you, or it could just been like in an all-star game or in the off season, like who are, who are some other hitters that you either played with or rub elbows with that really stood out as people you learned from and now you use to teach others? So Glenn Allen Hill um, was my first hitting coach when I went to Modesto Nuts uh, High A um, out of college. And if it wasn't for him, I, I never would have made it. Mm -hmm. And I give all the credit to him. Now, when we go back to Glenn Allen Hill, he learned from Barry Bonds um, with the years of in San Francisco and picking his brain and just he talks like Barry the whole deal. So everything that I know now today, and I'm still learning, um, but my swing and, and what I did was all off of Barry Bond stuff. Um, and thank you. Know, thank God, you know, Glenn Allen Hill was my hitting coach. So I had my own unique way, but if you look at Barry and you look at myself, it was a toe tap. It was a hand drop. Um, all those things. There's a lot of all the drills, you know, that he did, I would do. So, uh, and I've only had. So a you few did not have the hitch. You, you, no, I didn't you know what I was doing. The hitch. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I was. My hands were held somewhat high. I was trying to be Derek Jeter, trying to be no more the next day, whoever it was, and yeah. then I would just fly forward, compete, figure um, it out. Yeah, the just whole deal, just trying to survive. Mm -hmm. And then when I brought the the hitch, whatever you want to call it, the hand pump, the hand drop, it was completely different. It allowed me to to keep my head still allowed me to hit, you know, behind the baseball catch balls out in front. And it was uh, off to the races after that, as far as how good I felt and like, wow, I can be an impact player. Hey, Tula, let me, uh, before we get to the coaching aspect, I, I want to put a bow on the Long Beach state thing, right? Like yeah. in spite of what some of us might've said to recruits, going to Long Beach didn't ruin you as a hitter. In fact, <laughs> it turned out really, really well for you. So, you know, I, I, I think, Sometimes we look at hitting coaches and I guess in all walks of life and you think, hey, if you get the wrong coach for X amount of time, it's all over. Like it's just that's just not the way athletics works. It's you know, you have to learn how to um, be your own coach and all those types of things. Here's here's the question I wanted to get to when you think about your professional career. Did you have to make decisions on, hey, there's a time to tinker and then there's a time where I just have to kind of compete? Because I, I do worry about that with, with athletes that sometimes the results trick you into thinking you need to make a major change. And really, it was just the game being hard on you. So did you have to – how did you navigate that? Like, hey, now I'm over tinkering or now, hey, I just got to kind of compete my way through this. I would say I was always tinkering because I, I, I never really felt good offensively. It was always a grind for me for a long time. So I was always, you know, uh, if you look at some of my rookie video with the Rockies, I was spread out. And if you look at my college stuff, I was standing straight up. And then if you look at some of my years where I was rolling, I was a little bit um, in between those. So I've hit all types of, of, of different ways. But the one thing that never turned off for me was the compete mode. I never got to the point where it was like I was beat before the game or just I always had that. And I'd say at the end of the day, that was the most important piece for me is that I never backed down from the pitcher. And I always felt no matter if I was featuring my F swing or my A swing, I was going to find a way to beat you. And, and I think really, you know, that's where the coaching came from is, is I do understand that part. And if you feel like you have a chance up there, you honestly do. Yeah. yeah. And I would just add to that runes. I think there is a, piece where the two work together and anybody that follows golf knows like there's a part that helps you grind when you think you found something by tinkering like oh you know I stink but if I do this I'm I'm gonna be, I got a shot tomorrow like he's saying like they're gonna work post game so that they go to bed thinking tomorrow's gonna be different 
some of that's placebo effect we know right Tr- right Troy but right. some of it matters like I think one of the best self-talk athletes of all time is Phil Mickelson like Phil could shoot 81 in the first round of a major and the post round the post round presser he's like you know what those last two holes I found something and I think I, I got a low one in me tomorrow and you're sitting there going Phil you literally hit the ball on every edge of the golf course today how could and then a lot of times a lot of times he did figure it out right so I think I think part of the figuring your way through the stream of the difficulty of a sport like baseball is you got to find things not only internally but even sometimes with some external cues that give you hope for the next day or the next day B or you know we're facing a dude on the mound the next day like why should I even go up there? What can I find to believe in? What what gives me hope that I got a shot? Um, and Tulo, like Cal Ripken Jr. is a, a great example of a guy like you that was constantly tinkering. Um, and I think if we had him on, he would say that, that those tinkers gave him new life. Like, it gives you some it. hope. It yeah. gives you some hope for the next day that, all right, mm-hmm. this stance is going to work or – whatever it may be, you know, these batting gloves, I've got two hits in these batting gloves before. So, (laughs) you know, and that's the game. But I I always said, I always tried to put, uh, looking back, I'm starting to learn more about myself as a player, as far Mm as man, that's what made me good or that's what got in my way. So Mm -hmm. I think what made me good was the fact of, I always put a positive twist on something. It was, I I like that I was 0 for 4 or I'm hitting 200 at the all-star break because no one expects anything from me. When, mm-hmm. you know, like whatever it is, I just put good, a twist on it. Positive and, self-talk, yep. And, and I learned that mostly from other sports, to be honest. I learned that from football. I learned that from basketball of, you know what, uh, this is second half in a basketball game. We're down by 20. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be the guy that just starts launching three-pointers here because we're either going to get back in this game or it's going to be a blowout anyway. And I wasn't scared to miss the three-pointers. But I think all those experiences in the other sports really helped me just put a twist on okay, these are my stats right now, just like that's the scoreboard, and we're down, and I'm down and out right now, but you know what? I can come back, and I think Mm. I really credit the other sports to just really molding me into the right mental aspect of the game. Mm. 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 I I would say, too, let's get to – we'll fast forward to the coaching part, too, though, but, you know, like I keep coming back to your dad in this whole thing. Like, you know, Berkey, you mentioned Phil Mickelson. I always think about Dustin Pedroia, who we had at Arizona State, where – the mental game was like whatever Dustin's parents did, Guy and Debbie, and they were amazing. Like Dustin was convinced his whole life that any failure was a complete fluke. And like, <laughs> if we could turn that into a pill, we should give mm. all of mankind that. Like it was, <laughs> it was just unbelievable how mm. unshakable his confidence mm. was. Well, um, and, and to me, like, you know, a lot of this is about, hey, what if I'm a dad – what do I, what do I pour into my son? Mm -hmm. And I, you know, we've all been asked that question a million times. And I, I come back to that a lot. I just like, if you can convince your son that, that, you know, let's put respect and treating people well aside. Like if you convince your son that he's invincible on an athletic field, everything else will work itself out. Like he'll figure out the right swing. He'll figure it. Now, again, that's extreme. I'm oversimplifying clearly, (laughs) but with, without that mindset, even the perfect swing has got big problems. And so, you know, we, we want both. There's no question about mm. it. But Well, I love that you mentioned Pedroia because he always gave me a hope, meaning <laughs> right. I, I played, you know, against Pedroia a lot. Um, there was some great battles between, you know, our Long Beach teams and his Arizona State teams. And, man, that guy is like, if he can be that good, then I can do it. I'm way bigger mm-hmm. than him. I'm way mm-hmm. stronger. Mm-hmm. I'm probably faster, even though I'm not fast. I have more power. So every every aspect, I thought I was a better a better player than him with the skill set. But then he's going out there producing, hitting for a high average. And then you just – I followed him all the way to the big leagues. His rookie year, I think, what, did he win? Did he win MVP and rookie so of the rookie year? So rookie of the year first, his rookie okay. of the year in 07 and then MVP in 08, if I'm but, I math. But right. right there, I was just playing against a guy in college, and I said, if he can go to the big leagues and do it, then I have mm-hmm. hope. So, mm-hmm. But where I started with this and what I wanted to say is it's all built off the work ethic. Mm. That's what gave Pedroia the hope every day and the, the, the ability to turn his mindset to go, it's a fluke that I'm – that I'm not doing well right now because I am outworking everybody in this locker room and possibly in major league baseball. Therefore I'm going to get the results. And 
that that was me. The, the work ethic always gave me hope that I was going to turn it around. When you don't have the work ethic and you know deep down inside, you know what, I'm not working as hard as so-and-so, it's hard to get in that box and go, I'm going to find a way to beat you or mm-hmm. this thing's going to turn. Yeah, well said. Hey, let's let's fast forward. So you're, you're, you know, you go from playing, then next thing you know, you're working with the hitters at Texas and working with those players. And, you know, there's so much to hitting. There's mentality, approach, there's mechanics, there's all, all of those things. What what were the things that you emphasized? With, and, and here's the other thing about your hitters at Texas, as good as they were, you know, they're they're maybe they're not you know, a talent like you or Pedroia or Berkey, you know, like, like you have to coach all different talent levels in a college setting like that. What were some of the things that you emphasized with those guys? So one thing, uh, so Jason Giambi was someone I play with in Colorado and he told me something that I always remember. Uh, he said, you know what? I think I'm going to be a really good coach one day, or I can really help in the clubhouse because I've won MVPs, but I've also got released. Hmm. Okay. So, and that, hit home with me because I'm like, wow, he can help everybody in this locker room because you have the superstar players in the locker room. And then you have the guys that every day they walk in the locker room, they think they're going to get released. And that was valuable person to have on the team because there wasn't one person he can touch. So where I'm going with this is for myself and hitting, I've hit every way I've hit spread out. I've hit with my hands high. I've hit with my hands low. I've hit with an open stance close and I can go on and on with all the different things I did. So a lot of times when you get a good big league hitter, they've only hit one way and it's kind of always worked or they haven't tinkered so much. Now, I was the ultimate guy that did everything. Um, So therefore, I remember Jason's talk and then I turned that on the hitting side and said, you know what? I can help every hitter because I have had those fills that they've had. I mean, people thought I was crazy. Uh, in the big leagues, when I went over to Toronto, I saw Jose Batista and Josh Donaldson hit with leg kicks. Well, what do you think I hit with in spring training after mm-hmm. I'd already been a pretty good player in the big leagues? I changed it all up and I went to a leg kick, trying to learn the leg kick thing. Now, hey, it didn't work out. I could always go back to my toe tap. But all those experiences of trying to hit different ways is what led me to, you know what, I can go to college baseball. And I can relate to a whole bunch of different hitters that do different things and not just teach one way. Love it. What about, what about, so this is, this gets into the nuts and bolts of what we're going to be talking about here. Uh, you know, maybe once we, we uh, wrap this thing up, but you've talked a lot about getting ready to hit. You've talked a lot about the mentality of hitting, but we haven't talked about the way the bat moves in the swing. One of the things that I talk a lot about with hitting is <clears throat> there's a lot of things that influence your swing, but the swing itself is actually the point in which the bat moves forward and through the ball, right? We get ready to swing and then we actually swing, right? So you tinkered a ton. I'm not saying you didn't tinker with the path, but everything that you've talked about tinkering to this point is stance and load, right? Right from a swing standpoint and you answer this obviously however like how much did you actually tinker as a player or now as a coach with the way the bat moves um yeah some I would just you know when someone asks me and I think I I say this a lot is I'm looking for are they front side hitters or does their backside fire first that's probably the most important thing to me and I've said that numerous times when people talk to me about hitting and basically Um, Can you get yourself in position where your first move is coming from your backside and not pulling from your front side? Um, Now, that's why I talk about stance and kind of somewhat the load, because I think everything after that, um, I don't worry about. I'm trying to I worry about setup and then I worry about finish. If your setup can be comfortable and you can get yourself in a spot where you're I, I feel good, I could see. And you can get to the right finish, which for me and the hitters that I teach is going to be finishing high and not coming across your body, which is, you know, I always say you're playing tennis right now, which is mean you're getting your top spin. If you can get to the right setup and to the right finish, I don't worry about everything in between that as far as when I'm teaching hitting. Now, when I break it down and I'm watching in my in my room 
and I'm, you know, click, 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 watching where the bat path is going. I'm doing that as a coach, but I know how hard hitting is, and you can't worry about that as a hitter. So that's why I like to say, what's your setup? How's your finish? As simple as that. And I know if those two add up, everything else in between those, it's going to take care of itself, where I think too many people get into the swing of what's going on, and now you're hit, hitting with a clouded head and trying to fill it out right in the middle of your swing which is not allowing you to get your swing off. Now, I understand this is just all my opinion, but that's kind of what I base a lot of my stuff off of. Got to love it. Hey, Tula, let's transition to coaching, coaching your son. So, so tell us about your son. Tell, you know, how old is he? And, you know, cause that is kind of one of those things where you're, you know, it's from the jump, right? Like, you know, your, your son comes into the world and he's never hit a baseball before and you're going to take him from zero all the way through his hitting journey. Tell us what, what, how you've, yeah, introduce this to your son and how you've worked with him as a hitter. Yeah. Um, it's been fun. It's been a challenge. Um, I've learned a lot from him. Um, how old is he now? Been, he, he's going to be nine in January. So, and awesome. he's, um, He's a way better hitter than I ever was at that age. Um, he's, he's, he's solid. Um, obviously, he's going to have a target on his back. Uh, we talk about that all the time. But I think watching, I'll go back to Holiday. So, you know, Jackson's number one pick uh, in the MLB draft. Well, I was with Jackson in the, in the locker room um, for a lot of years and throwing to him, you know, after games. And just there was a lot of interaction between me and Jackson. And I watched how he, he grew up and the whole deal. And I, Still can't believe that he was the number one pick, but when I think about it, I could go, I could see it. Um, so I've really tried to model um, my son now. You know, we'll see what happens, but I've tried to model it a little bit off of what Maddie's done uh, with his kids because he's had nothing but success. And then Ethan coming along is 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 a special player himself. But I've really tried to take that model and and apply it to my son. Um, with the hitting stuff, I think I just try to tell him to be an athlete, be free, easy. Um, you know, we don't tinker too much with hitting mechanics other than we're trying to hit it, hit it hard, uh, hit it far. Um, I think he, he plays some tennis. I'm a big advocate and a big fan of tennis. Uh, that came from Bo Bichette. Uh, Dante Bichette was my hitting coach. And I saw some of the qualities that that gave Bo in his swing. So my son plays a lot of tennis. I've seen the benefit of that. Um, in, in the swing, honestly, we go out there, we do work a lot, but at the same time, it's not too much on mechanics. Once again, I'm not big on mechanics. It's your setup. He has a toe tap like me. Can you get to your finish? Um, and, and I know I might make it sound pretty simple, but if you can get through these kids' heads in the college or at a young age that it can be simple, I think it some of that clutter gets gets out of there real quick. Berkey, why don't you take that? By the way, I love the tennis analogy. Ta our friend Todd Walker is a huge like he's like the Federer of adults now. Okay. <laughs> Tito, <laughs> so no, he did that after his career. Let's right. Talk about serious hand eye coordination. Todd oh my gosh, yes, yeah. Berkey. Tell you you you've got multiple sons. Some would tease you. You've got you know a cadre of sons. What, yeah, how, I, I, how are you teaching we, the boys to hit? Yeah, well, I, you know I. I think the best compliment I can give anybody's kid that I work with is that I coach them just like I do my kids. Like, so there's, they're not, my kids aren't getting any special sauce that I wouldn't give your kid if he was in my cage. Um, I think the, the secret sauce in coaching youngsters is when you see one that has a natural gift for bat to ball and to hit line drives to try not to, put your stamp on them, so to speak, mm. like, like Troy's saying, let them be an athlete. If we're compressing line drives regularly through the big part of the field, let's just keep doing it. Right. But one thing I've seen working with a lot of kids over the last 12 years, there are some swings that are just flat broken and they will never work. And so the game's miserable. We know that when you can't hit, it's just no fun. Like you only get to run the bases when you get on base. Right. Uh, and on defense, we all like, or just waiting for our turn to touch the ball, right? It's not like the other sports where the ball's in your hand all the time. And so it's like, how can I, the, the only way for this kid to have fun is to hit well. And if you're chopping straight down or you're dropping, falling behind, like the batch is not going to be in the zone long enough to ever compress the baseball and you're never going to have results 
Um, and so that's not going to be any fun. So fixing broken swings are one of my favorite things to do. I'm like a doctor that likes to look at odd, like tumors or something. You're like, you're looking at a kid and you're like, like when I first started teaching, I loved to work with the best kids. Now, when a kid comes into my cage, it's totally broken. I'll look at him like, well, now, why would you do that? Like, what would be, why would that be a good idea? So I, I like to try to, um, there's nothing quite like getting a kid to, to, to see an aha moment of like, oh, that was a glimpse of what the ball can do when I actually get on plane and hit through the middle of it. And um, so with my boys, Jackson naturally gets stuck and gets a little under plane and can be a flare to right, top spinner to left. My oldest boy, who's now 13. Um, and Eli <clears throat> can be a little cross and can hit a lot of choppers and, and, and cut fly balls. So it's funny, we could go hit and we I could be saying the exact opposite thing to Jackson that I'm saying to Eli because their miss is different. Um, and what's funny is when they play golf, we play a decent amount of golf, like Jackson hits hooks and Eli hits flares, hits slices. Oh, wow. And so it's it's fascinating. I, as a teacher, I love to work through the messiness of it. And uh, I tell them all the time, if I could put your two swings together, we'd be in business. Um but, um, you know, it's fun. It's fun. Eli pulls the ball a ton and uh, on the ground, and Jackson hits a bunch of balls to right center. And so we're both, you know, we're trying to get to the middle for both of them. Uh, but definitely the other sports, I think, help them, like Troy's saying, with just the mentality of like, hey, no matter how our swing feels today, let's, 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 let's get in that box and try to get our three best swings off. And if that one doesn't go our way, let's try to do it again the next time, you know? Yeah. Tulo, just so we're clear, uh, Jackson Burke and Eli Burke, we've got soft verbal commitments to Notre Dame football for those kids, but the dad's been a little bit of a problem, but it's all right. We're working through it. Hey, Tulo, let's wrap with this, you know, because this is a, a, a D1 baseball podcast. Give us give us a good, uh, like a, a favorite memory of working with a player at Texas, something that jumps out. You know, I, I think let's stay offensively, but yeah, what, what what's one of your memories from working with the kids at Texas that stands out? Well, I have so many. It's hard to pick one. Um, How about Melendez? Give us a good yeah. Melendez story. Well, people always ask about Melendez. He goes mm -hmm. from, you know, light recruit to, you know, Golden Spikes winner, best player in college baseball, best hitter in college baseball. Um, and I saw it, you know, from when it got there to when it left. And it was it was different. Um, but I'll go back to our, our uh, the College World Series home run that he hit against Mississippi State. OK, so. Um, it was a big homer for for our team, but ultimately what it did for him, uh, Ivan is someone that um, at times, like us all, and the reason why I share this story is he questions his ability, even though he's a really, really good hitter. Um, and, and that's how a lot of hitters are. Good hitters at times can be insecure. They always want to be on top of their game, and and a lot of times as a hitter, you're not. So what that homer did, okay, we, we leave that, uh, we leave Omaha, and think about all the times he watched that swing and that reaction to what was going on, either in the Twitter world, Instagram, people saying, I remember that Homer at Mississippi State. And I'm big into the mental game. That's part of, um, you know, what I did at Texas and what I truly believe in uh, from my Long Beach State days with Ken Revisa. So that's another part of the, the, the uh, method. But he replayed that swing and probably watched it, me, no, no and Ivan a thousand times in the off season. So when he came back the next year to Texas, it was like, oh, I rake. Uh, did you see that Homer against Mississippi state? Like I'm going to dominate this year. These guys don't have a chance. Cause that was basically his last swing of the year. And he worked on some, some stuff and he got a little confidence, but at the end of the day, I would say that was the biggest turning point more so than anything I taught him was the fact of, he just got that extreme confidence. So that's a little story in one of the moments how I, I feel how powerful your mind can be when you mm. when you believe in yourself. That is so great. I you know, I, I think I've told you this story, Berkey, but one of the years I was at Arizona State, Bob Welch, the late Bob Welch was mm -hmm. our uh, just the, one of the most beautiful humans of all time. And um, he would get on our players all the time about the, the video they'd watch. And he'd say, you guys go in there and just beat yourselves up over video. Why even bother? The game will beat you up plenty. Like yeah. you don't need to do that. Like now, if you want to go in there and watch the good stuff, like invite me, I would like to join mm -hmm. you. But if you're going to go in there and just beat yourself down, then I, I, I got no time for that. Oh, so great. 
Tulo, this has been awesome, man. Yeah. We, we talked for 32 <clears throat> minutes. We could have talked for 132 minutes. That's right. Um, no, it was so great. So, um, man, we really appreciate this. And, and let's stay in touch for sure. This, is, this has been great. Awesome. Yeah. I thank you guys. And, and once again, you know, what you guys are doing for college baseball is uh, uh, pumps me up. Uh, I appreciate you guys. I really do. And anytime you guys need anything from me, let me know. Thanks, we'll buddy. Yep. Be well, Tulo. We'll see you guys. Man, Berkey, that was awesome. That was uh, mm. that was better than I, I thought it would be. Tulo was fantastic. And what a great what a great story he has to tell. All right. So let's get into this, Berkey. So I'm thinking of I'm going to give you the context for this conversation. Okay. I'm thinking about my dad, the great Michael P. Rooney Jr., who was a phenomenal high school track and field oh, cross country third? coach. You're I'm the, the third. third. Yeah. Oh, Trips. Okay. My cousins okay. called me Trips growing up and I thought they were ripping on me. I thought they were calling me clumsy. Okay. So All we right. had to work I'm through that. Speaking of mental game. Yes. So <laughs> my dad was a great coach, Berkey. He won two city titles as a track coach cross country, took teams to the Penn Relays Championship of America. But track and baseball are not the same sport, clearly. And, you know, as my mom would give my dad a hard time, like, you know, breaking clipboards and throwing stopwatches at people is not going to help your son be a better hitter. Right? Like that's, that's, I'm kind of sort of kidding, but you know, my dad was my coach all the way through coach, our little league all-star team. Like he was into it. coach, our American Legion team. I'm trying to put my dad in the year 2023. How is he supposed to sift through all this stuff? How is he, you know, and some of it's scary. Like if you hit too many ground balls, you're doomed. And then, you know, the old school philosophy is if you're hitting weak fly balls, you're doomed. So, you know, you, you, you are one of the best at this. I, you know, that's one of my favorite part of your broadcast is you really can simplify and diagnose a swing where you're not blowing people away, but you're giving them great information. Mm. How are people supposed to sift through all this? Like, yeah, let, let's break this down. Well, I think, I think Troy did a good job of just trying to keep it simple. I do think athletic posture, you know, he talked a lot about the setup, athletic posture, um, understanding how to get ready to swing, whether that's, you know, Tr Troy, I thought brought up some good points about he's kind of done it all so he can relate to mm -hmm. what, how a different hitter wants to get ready. So to me, when I'm talking about hitting, we need to talk about getting ready to swing and then the swing itself, right? So the getting ready part is somebody that works with a lot of young hitters. It's crazy how few hitters do a good job of getting ready to swing. And so that's some of the stuff Troy was talking about tinkering with, which is, you know, you got Barry Bonds that had kind of a hitch, right? The hands went down mm -hmm. and then back up. Uh, you have some hitters like a Mike Trout that starts with his hands super high. And then as he leg kicks, they get loaded into, uh, you know, more of a, a classic position. You got some hitters that'll just kind of start there and stay there. Right. And then, you know, every Tony Batista, everywhere in between. And similar to Troy, I've, I've been quite a tinkerer myself. Uh, and so the first thing we got to do is get ready to swing. And that move gets us in a position and a posture to make our best swing. It's also a lot of people don't think about this. That's also the move that you're making when you're seeing the ball. Right. right. So like I'm toe tapping, I'm leg kicking, I'm, I'm uh, hitching, I'm separating. Like this is what's happening as I'm discerning the pitch. Mm -hmm. Master slow ball or strike up or down in or out like am I in or out myself like am I swinging or am I taking this is what I'm doing I'm you know I, I like to call it a gather right like I'm gathering I'm getting my body is getting loaded into an extremely athletic position that separation move but I'm also giving my eyes time to decide mm -hmm. right and this is a big part of the jump I made in college um, you know, you, you kind of saw me in year three, year, year two, I was, a, it was unpleasant was a, being on the other side of the field from <laughs> you in year three. I would have preferred year one, even though you yeah. did just fine. Yeah. Year one and two, I was a good hitter. I was a hit collector. I got a ton of hits, a lot of doubles, but coach Delmonico, and I'm, and I'm passionate about this subject. Coach Delmonico wasn't afraid to tell a good hitter. I think you can be great. Mm -hmm. and and really encouraged me to get more out of my load. I was very much a kind of fall forward, use my hands kind of guy. All of a sudden, I basically tried to copy Todd Helton. He was one of the best hitters in the world at the time. He was a Tennessee guy. So I started with my hands high, went with a leg kick, and all of a sudden now I'm getting what Troy was just talking about. I'm getting behind the ball. I'm getting loaded up, 
I got a little confidence. I had hit home runs in high school, so I felt like I could do it. And I went from four my sophomore year to 20 my junior year because of a mechanical adjustment. I made mm-hmm. a change to the way, not my swing. Now, I do think my swing probably got a touch more uphill because I thought I could do it because I believed I could do it. Uh, but it was really more of how I was getting ready to swing, right? Mm -hmm. So that's number one, and Troy talked a lot about that. But number two is now the bat actually has to move, right? Mm -hmm. And here's what I will tell most people. The bat moves in a pretty similar manner for all good hitters. Ted Williams said it 70 years ago, 60 years ago. Like the proper swing is about an 8 to 10 degree, 12 degree uppercut. Because the pitch is coming downhill, so we're trying to match the plane of of the ball. The bat should move ever so slightly up. Now, this is where it gets messy, Mike. This is where we're in the crux of what we're here to talk about is nobody with a, nobody willing to have a fair conversation will say that the bat doesn't move up. The bat moves right. up. The bat That's should true. move up, okay? It has to move up. The question is, what are the feels, drills, thoughts, approaches that helps me to get that bat on plane and move the bat slightly up and still be efficient to the front part of the zone? Because mm-hmm. any baseball game played today, I mean, heck, my son last year had to face a 12-year-old throwing 80 from 50 feet. Like, so, yeah, we need the bat to move slightly uphill, but it better get in front of you in the blink of an eye. Right. Right? So if I'm spending a bunch of time back here, like the odds of ever hitting a real fastball um, are slim. Now, here's the thing. There are some people that can feel like this move is what they want to do, and maybe they don't quite make that move, but that's what they feel like they're doing. There's also, I play with a lot of great hitters. There's a lot of great hitters when you listen to them talk that think they were swinging straight down. Right. But they weren't, but that's what they felt, right? So this difference between feel and real it can get messy. Real is really not that much in question. What right. really is supposed to happen is, is what I call science, right? The art is what do you need to feel to make your real the best it needs to be to have consistent results. And we also, I'm not the guy that says, don't listen to Aaron Judge because you'll never be six seven two seventy. But there is some value in like, I don't know, 90% of amateur baseball needs to be really happy with a line drive over an infielder's head. Right. Yep. That That, that I, is fair, right? I mean. Yeah. I think that's that's the anchor that, that I feel like you're giving me right now, Perky, because I'm not a science guy, but I've been around a lot of baseball. And, like, I feel like the anchor you're giving me here is at the end of the day, it's the line drive. Like, good hitters hit line drives a lot. And some of the line drives will leave the yard. Mm -hmm. But I think what happens in this, like, you know, if you think of it in political terms, the fly ball camp uses ground balls to, you know, kind of polarize their, you know, Mm -hmm. weaponize Mm -hmm. their position. Mm -hmm. The, um, you know, and and we all know that you hit too many ground balls and that's not going to go well. But then the old school camp, which, you know, I'm not being critical here, but they will use weak fly ball outs as a way to weaponize the hit, you know, you, you know what I'm saying? But yes. at the end of the day, they're both saying the same thing, kind of, sort of, that a great, you know, a, 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 the, the, the great The answer's screen. in the middle. The yeah, answer's right. in the middle. Yeah. That's just what yeah. it is. So, so LSU, I don't know if Jay Johnson kept it, but I know three, four years ago when they redid their hitting facility, they put a line on the back of every tunnel at 15, well, let's use some new school language, at 15 degree launch. Mm-hmm. Why? Because I think our friends at 643, had a chart that said the number one average batting average, not that that's King, but getting a base hit's always a good thing. The number one average launch was 15 degrees. It was like 920 or 910. So like if you hit a 15 degree liner, you almost were getting a hit every time. Mm -hmm. And you know what a 15 degree liner is? It's essentially over the infield's head. That's, that's what it is. Right. Mm -hmm. And what I would say is, the bigger and strong, you know, my dad, I, I talk about my upbringing, like my dad was a college baseball coach, high school and college baseball coach. Okay. I'm grateful that he wasn't an extreme guy on either. He used to tell me hit line drives in the middle of the field again to the old school guy that's listening to us right now. 
that always has been and always will be a good philosophy. That's right. What we have now is the messiness of how to produce. How? What's the best way? What are the best drills to produce that, right? I don't think even the newest of new school guys thinks that the majority of the world should be hitting 30 degree high line or fly balls. Like, mm -hmm. I don't, the, I think the, 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 the confusion comes in, what are the drills that allow me to produce let's just say 15 to 25 degree launch. And, and this is where the old school guys I think need to bend. A line drive is in the air. Yes. The, the ball, that is a ball that's in the air, right? Right. Um, and so uh, we, we tend to hear the phrase in the air. What do we think? High, right? But like a line drive is, is above the ground. Thus it's in the air. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? So, uh, hitting the ball between 15 to 25 degrees. And we know, you know, you look at baseball savant or whatever, most of the home runs are between 28 and 32 degrees. Well, my dad used to tell me when I was a kid, a home run's a line drive you just missed. Well, that, that's true. That's, mm -hmm. that's what it is. Uh, again, for most. Now, if I am a physical freak and, and I can regularly hit the ball from 25 to 35 degrees and that ball goes way over everybody's head in today's world, I would encourage you to produce that launch regularly in your work. Now, yeah. I would still argue that your work should be more in the 20 to 25 degree. Um, but by all means, go ahead. Yeah. You know? But Berkey, how do you sift through? Here's the problem. Um, like, what if I'm producing that angle consistently in BP when it's 55 and, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, mm -hmm. you know, like, like to your point earlier, like, like what Jackson's experience, like the game is so different. And I think that's where we, we you know, we're, we're just killing home runs, you know, and, you know, in college baseball, these D1 kids are so talented. There are plenty of D1 mm -hmm. hitters where you, they could literally hit every ball and BP out of the yard and way out of the yard. But is that the right swing for the game when the velocity is almost 2x of what they're facing in BP? Well, I will say this. In today's game. Almost everybody that's playing college baseball is working a ton off very high speed machines. That's true. And, and even to the point where that a lot of teams are doing that for their on field pregame BP. Mm -hmm. Now, there's still plenty of guys throwing coach BP, right? Um, and that's not necessarily wrong. I think you can overdo because what the what the high velocity machines do, almost all those machines are like high spin rate. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I think too much of any one thing can lead to to problems, right? But I will tell you back to my story, like most people would be shocked to hear this about Coach DeMonico, but he loved us to hit home runs our last two rounds. He, he number one, wanted us to get in that frame of mind. And number two, he liked the way it looked to the other team. He Love wanted that. the other coaching staff to see us hit the ball out of the ballpark. And as much as he was a base running guy and liked the inside game, he loved three run homers too. Like that's, I think coach Delmonico is, was a very well-rounded coach. And I own sure. a lot of the reason I was able to steal bases and the reason I was able to hit home runs. Uh, so when people ask me why the big jump, I would talk to them about mechanics, but I would also talk to them about approach of like, I practiced it a lot and people would get real, like imagine that 25 years and people are like, Whoa, what do you mean? You're, you're practicing hitting home runs. And I right. was like, yeah. And, that gave me confidence if I was in a 2-0 count and I knew I had a guy backed into a corner and he was giving me a heater, I knew how to make a swing that produced a well-hit fly ball that didn't pull me off the ball, right? right? So, like, when a head coach gives a team freedom to hit home runs and you spend two rounds hitting nothing but hook shots foul down the left field line, well, that's not working. Right. <laughs> right? The goal was to hit it with good spin and good carry into the big part of the park. So – I had learned the swing that allowed me to have that success. And so then I would take it into the game. Like I trusted myself to try. I know this is, I was trying to hit a homer. I trusted the swing that would allow me to do that and have, and it, it might be a line drive up the middle anyway, but in my mind, I was trying to hit a ball over left center field wall. You see what I'm saying? So, yeah, totally. but I, I just think the new school, old school, the answer is in the middle. I think both groups would agree. The goal would be to hit line drives in the middle of the field. Right. Yep. The other anchor that I think you're giving us, Berkey, again, I'm thinking of dads 
And I'm thinking one of the problems with for, you know, if you're coaching a young hitter is that if you if you're worried as the adult, you don't know enough. Mm -hmm. And and one of the things that gives humans confidence is an identity. And some of these extreme concepts, you know, like like you could be old school extreme just as well as you could be new school extreme. Some of these extreme concepts, they they do. They fill that void. They give somebody an identity that they can yeah. plug into. But the problem, what I hear you saying is if you sell out to that, like you, you, if you're the dad, if you're the adult, you need to trust yourself more than that. You need, you know, you, yeah. you know more. Yeah. I heard you say yeah. it, you know more than you think you do. Uh-huh. Well, again, what result do we want to produce? Start at the yeah. end, work your way back. What, what would be, uh, we all know swing at strikes, take balls, like, you know, quality of bats, whatever. But if if the action, if we're just breaking it down to real simple, what kind of ball would I like to hit in this at bat? Mm-hmm. If the goal, if it, and I, again, I don't know a ton of people that would disagree with that. I want to hit a line drive to the outfield. Okay, well, what does the bat need to do to consistently produce line drives to the outfield? Well, you know, a lot of people will use this Nike swoosh as a pretty good example of what a swing should look like, right? So mm-hmm. let me see if I can do it. Yeah. So really tight on the backside, but it gets mm-hmm. on plane, right? And then it kind of works slightly up on the way through the zone, right? Mm-hmm. And so like, like I want it really tight, really efficient back here, but it does have to flatten out rooms. I can't, if the ball's here and my bat's up here, like that, I don't think that's going to end well, right? Like yeah. I, I got to get the bat behind the ball. Yep. And then as I hit the ball, the bat's going to slightly work up and hopefully produce a ball that, lifts above an infielder's head that again for do you the, think Berkey, the like what, majority of people that's a good result sorry to interrupt you but do you no, think okay. that, that one of the issues there is that this whole concept of like i think i'm thinking this way that you mm-hmm. can't hit up and compress the ball at the same time like compress means straight down but I, I i feel like i hear you saying that that that's a misnomer that compressing the ball and hitting that great line drive your swing still does have to have that you know, it's going to travel north at some point and you yeah, can still I mean, compress I, the ball. Well, compression happens with the most solid of contact. Think about it like this. What's the rarest ball hit in baseball? It's the knuckleball. Mm-hmm. Right? Like it comes every, when it happens, everybody's like, oh my gosh, you see that ball knuckle? Like Berkman used to hit like two a year. I saw Mike Cameron, <laughs> you talk about the flattest swing in the game. Like Berkman, just the bat was in the zone forever, right? I saw Mike Cameron take off for a ball into the right center field gap that Berkman hit at Minute Maid. And the ball ended up rolling up onto the hill, like he missed it by forty feet. He he oh got to ba- he got on base later in the game, and I was like, "Dude, what happened on the ball?" He goes, "Bro, that thing was knuckling like you've never seen a ball knuckle." Because Berkman would just hit it so square, right? Well, if I'm coming in from too steeply above, I'm going to hit a lot of chops yep. and cuts, right? I'm going to. This is one of the things I deal with with a lot of young kids that hit weak pop ups. And what happens when the ball's going up a lot? What do people naturally think? Oh, you're dropping your back shoulder and you're mm-hmm. swinging up. Well, I would I would say this, Runes. What is it? Nobody knows this more than you. What you probably did this. What does the guy who hits in and out do to hit a pop up to the catcher? Right. He's like, yeah. Like, okay. So if a kid's hitting a lot of infield pop ups, and it was because he was swinging up too much, his posture would be like so insanely extreme like yeah. lifting this way that it would be like not even a question. Most kids that hit are, are hitting a lot of infield pop-ups is because they're swinging down too much and the bat is clipping the bottom of the ball. The ball's hitting the top of the barrel and yeah. the ball goes straight up. Now to convince people of this, you have to put show them the video. Like, let me show you the bats. The bats actually moving down. Okay. Well, it's, but the, the, the what's the natural inclination? The ball's going up. So I need to swing down more. Mm-hmm. Okay. But here's, here's, what's great. The opposite is also true runes. The person that's hitting too many ground balls is often swinging up too much. Right. Now I'm, I'm swinging up so much that I'm tipping the top of the ball. What's the ball doing? It's going down. Yeah. Right. And so for Jackson, my Jackson, when he's going bad, it's, he's stuck uphill and he's hitting a lot of high fly balls to the middle opposite side of the field, and he's hitting tons of ground balls to third. Just mm-hmm. phew, ground ball to third. So I've got to flatten his turnout. We're talking about really trying to flatten it out because it's all shoulder plane, right? If my shoulders are 
too tilted, the bat's probably going to swing up, right? Mm -hmm. Conversely, if my shoulders get going, you know, over the top this way, the bat's probably going to go down and left, right? Which is Eli's problem. So I got these ops and and the kids I work with fall in the middle too. Again, what's the goal we're trying to produce? Line drives between the shortstop and second baseman consistently to give us a little margin for error with our timing. Uh, And to do that, again, the science of that is really not in question. The bat needs to get on plane with the ball and stay there. And as our posture produces a swing, like, you know, the old swing level. Okay, well, Runes, if I'm up here and I swing level, the bat's truly going to move level. But if Mm -hmm. I get into more of an athletic posture and kind of feel flat through the zone, the bat's going to naturally take that upward path, right? You see what I'm saying? So, like, the old school swing level isn't scientifically correct, but the feel of trying to get the barrel square behind the ball around a tilted spine angle will actually help produce the upward trajectory to your path that you need to actually hit it consistently with the right compression. Um, Even though the new schoolers might not want to hear that, um, if you get into a good posture, a feel of the bat moving really flat will kind of hopefully help you get there quickly, but then stay there for a long period of time to give us some margin, right? Because being on time is hard. I don't care if you're playing eight U or playing in the big leagues. It's hard to be on time. Yep. Oh man, this is so good. It, it's uh, yeah, and I, I I love that we have an anchor. We're leaving this conversation, which is like this is like the first of seven thousand conversations. I think that's a big takeaway too. Like if you have a son that you know, or a daughter who's really interested in in baseball or softball and hitting a baseball, hitting a softball, you just these conversations have to happen a lot. Mm-hmm. You know, like you, I I love those two anchors. The line drive to the outfield is 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 the goal. Line drive to the middle of the field as Big Al would say, your dad. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, and you know more than you think you do. It's yeah. not, it's not, we, we don't need NASA um, no. for this. And, and we don't, don't be need- afraid. Don't be afraid to contradict yourself. I tell people this all the time. If you come mm-hmm. to my cage, you'll hear me contradict myself 20 times because who's in front of me? What do they struggle with? Yeah. And if I got a kid that's swinging straight up and hitting nothing but weak fly balls and top spinners to third, dude, we got, we might need to feel down. Like, Mm -hmm. I I want you to feel like you're swinging straight down. But if I got a kid that is chopping the ball straight in front of the plate, bro, let's try to get uphill. Yeah. Like, let's, I want you to feel like you're swinging straight up to the sky, right? And the answer is kind of in the middle. Uh, The truth is in the tape. Just turn on the tape. Like, if you, I don't care if you got an Aaron Judge new school guy or an A Rod old school guy, when you turn on the tape, their bats are moving in a, again, get rid of all the early stuff, even though actually Judge and A-Rod get ready in a pretty similar manner. What, you know, Judge hangs back a little bit more than A-Rod did. A-Rod, especially early on, was maybe a little more into his front side. But, like, the path the bat is taking is very, very similar. Yeah. Yeah. That, and that's where video is so powerful, right? It's like, first of all, like, learning your identity, figure out who you are. Like, you're saying, you know, Hey, 30 years ago, we had no idea. I, you know, every year you had no idea what your swing was. There was no mm. video back then. It was like, you just got done playing basketball. It's like, I don't even know. Am I, am I a left-handed hitter or a right-handed hitter? I can't even remember. <laughs> right. But now these kids can really, and parents can mm. really, you know, watch video, understand who they are as a hitter. But man, that story Tulo told us about Ivan Melendez where, Hey, you've got your best swing and your best moment. If you can get video of that, you probably can't watch that enough. Mm. No, you know, just singe and- that in there. And I know we got a bunch of D1 co- college baseball, high school baseball coaches listening. If they haven't tuned me out yet, I, I just want one one kind of – your kids are watching everything that's out there. Yes. They just are. So if you want to talk to them, if you really want to communicate with them, it's helpful for you to know what's being taught. I follow tons of guys on Twitter that I don't agree with. But I love to know what they're teaching. And sometimes I'll use something and be like, this might work for you. I saw this clip today. And if we can get past judging people and calling them names and putting them in categories like you're talking about and just say, my goal is to help the hitter in front of me. I know, especially if we're talking high school and college kids, I know this guy's on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter. Like he's he's out there searching swing information. So if I'm if I can't at least have a rational conversation with him about some dude that he's latched onto that's influencing how he's swinging the bat, then I've kind of lost him before we've even started. 
right? Yeah. Um, and so having at least a, a moderate understanding of what's being taught out there so that you can, hey, bro, you've been watching this dude too much? Because it looks like, it looks like you're doing the, and, and, and the other thing though is if a kid is raking, then maybe it works for him. Like, yeah, it, you know what I'm saying? Like, it, it, if he's having great success, why do I have to change him? Yeah, it's like so, a Rod. A Rod thought he chopped the ball for 20 years and it and turned out pretty good. Runs, like, or 700 <laughs> or whatever he had. Like, good, you know. Hey, Lance Berkman always felt like he swung down. Now Lance is coaching Division One baseball. Yeah. And he's had to really work with like, man, there's a few different ways to skin this cat just because this is the way I did it doesn't mean that works for everybody else. And so just meeting kids where they're at, I think in general, trying to tell kids, stop listening to that. Stop looking like, I just don't think that's going to work. Yep. Uh, well said. Berkey, this was super fun. I knew it yeah. would be. This was super, super fun. Um, and that's it. We wouldn't do, do a special edition here. There's a lot going on in, in hitting these days. And so super fun to get our, our subject matter experts on here. So um, thanks for having sure. me on. And yes. I appreciate the invite. And maybe uh, maybe we could do this. One, like people could send in responses and questions. Maybe we could do Please. a follow up. Yeah. 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 You guys, if you want to get on the on the D1 Twitter handle, we will post this um, podcast there, this video there. It'll go on our podcast feed, but you can you can give us feedback anywhere. I think on that Twitter feed when we put the video up is probably a big, great place for it. So, yeah, to your point, Berkey, there will be a part two, maybe a part three to this. What what would you like us to unpack a little further? So um, that's it. Berkey, happy holidays, man. It was a pleasure. You too, brother. You too. All right. Be good, everybody.